there you can all see that oh very good there we are okay so uh Welcome everybody, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to our the second uh, in our series of webinars on the Water Framework Directive, uh, which we are holding uh, in collaboration with our friends in the Sustainable Water Network, that's SWAN uh, that you see on your screen there. And um, the Water Framework Directive is um, the most important piece of legislation we have uh, on water. Uh, and uh, achieving good status for our water bodies. Uh, and if you missed our webinar last week, uh, in which we took an overview of the Water Framework Directive uh, and took it back to basics, um, please go onto our YouTube channel or our website and you'll find a link to that. We're holding this webinar series because uh, there is a public consultation open at the moment uh, on the Water Framework Directive, and the government is preparing uh, what they call a river basin management plan, and I'm just holding it up there. Uh, that's also available on the website. Um, and uh, they want to know our views and your views uh, on what needs to go into that plan in order to achieve good status for, for all of our water bodies, um, which was supposed to happen by 2015, uh, but at the very latest, it's supposed to happen by 2027. So on your, your screen there, I'm just putting that up um, to show that uh, SWAN has uh, put a lot of information about this process on their website. And, uh, and you can go to their website and they've made making a consultation very easy and they've described all the various issues uh, in a very clear way. And so please do go on and, uh, and take a look at their work. So I'm going to stop sharing that now. Uh, and today in particular, uh, we're going to talk about physical modifications. Now, um, physical modifications are, uh, well, we'll hear more about what they are, but they basically are what they sound like. It's when we go into a river and we change the shape of the river, or we change the dynamic of the river um, so that it, uh, it, is, it is impacted by that work. And it's important because the Environmental uh, Protection Agency uh, has told us that um, the number of water bodies impacted by changes to uh, hydromorphology, so that's basically the shape of the river, is um, the second biggest pressure on our water bodies in Ireland after agriculture. So it's a very significant uh, pressure. And any of you who, uh, who are followers or supporters of the Irish Wildlife Trust will know that we've been campaigning for the last number of years around the Arterial Drainage Act, uh, and around flood relief schemes that, uh, that do an awful lot of damage to our river system. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about when we talk about physical modifications or damage to hydromorphology. And the other notable thing that the EBA has told us is that um, the pressure from physical modifications has increased uh, since the last round uh, of the Water Framework Directive. So this is a, it's a big problem and it's getting worse. So we have two uh, expert speakers for you today uh, uh, who are going to talk about this issue. And I'm gonna go first to uh, Mary Burke. And Mary Burke is a researcher in Trinity College Dublin and she did her PhD on floods in Australia. And I think Mary also worked on floods on Mars as well, which is, <laughs> um, <laughs> I imagine they don't have the same kind of issues with objectors on Mars that we do in Ireland. Um, and since 2017 has been working in Trinity uh, College on nature-based solutions and about uh, uh, flooding and rivers and all the things that are affected by um, physical modifications. So over to you, Mary, please, in your own time. Thank you. So just for people, I'm going to play a recording that I made uh, recently, as in last this morning, uh, just for efficiencies, because I tend to talk a bit too much. So I'm going to share my screen and play that video. And if that doesn't work, I'll deliver it live. So we just need to make sure that the audio comes through. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mary Burke from the Geography Department in Trinity College Dublin. And thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you today about some of the academic background and research around how we might better manage our river catch. So today this talk is going to be divided into three parts. We're going to start off with the basics, introducing you to what a catchment is and how the water moves through it. What is a floodplain and how we might use these floodplains better? We'll then 
move on to talk about some of the issues like what have we done to our landscape to really disrupt it and make things more difficult for us in living in this landscape and finally we're going to talk about the future uh, a future that i'm very optimistic about in terms of employing nature-based solutions to help kind of attenuate some of these more negative effects that uh, how we manage and live within our catchments are affecting both our water quality and the flood hazard that we experience. Thank you. So I'm going to begin with a brief introduction to the basics of rivers, river catchments, uh, the landforms, blah, blah, blah. With the effective management For the effective management for the effect in Ireland we take a catchment or a drainage basin approach to managing our rivers. You'll be familiar with the term integrated catchment management. So this slide is, is to basically show you what a catchment is and to let you know that the term catchment, watershed and drainage basin, they all mean the same thing. So this dotted line here outlines uh, physically the uh, boundary of a catchment and it's defined basically by which way when rain hits the ground it flows. It'll flow down slope towards the main trunk of the stream. So this is the important component in terms of both what it actually represents for water flow, but also the scale of it. This is a large scale catchment unit. For the effective management of our river catchments, we need to look at the smaller divisions, uh, both topographically and hydrographically, that are contained within that system. So basically where we have small first order tributaries feeding in, that is a sub catchment unit um, and they join together to form larger units. And it is very important when thinking about the nature based solutions to our river issues and river management that we realize that they are most effective at these smaller scales. Now, you combine that with the fact that our rain gauges, our towns, villages and cities are all located down here in the largest component of a river catchment. And the main premise of the nature-based approaches is that many features in multiple locations at smaller scales and low cost will combine to mitigate some of the water quality and water quantity, as in flood issues, that are experienced further down the system. So you would be familiar with the hydrological cycle where uh, you have water vapor in the form of clouds that condenses and forms precipitation, which flows across and through our landscape, reaching the streams and rivers, lakes and oceans, evaporation happens again, and there the cycle uh, continues. What is important is the detail yeah. of these components, because at every point, whether we have overland flow, whether we have through flow, whether we have soil pipes where we've got rapid movement uh, in the soil of water, whether there's vegetation intercepting the flow. These are all points at which nature based approaches can be implemented to improve the water quality and to slow down the movement of water over and through this system. Now, as that water moves across and through our landscape, it transports sediment and eventually deposits it. And so that brings us to the bottom of valleys. And we're now going to look at what we find there in terms of landform units. So in Ireland, very commonly, our rivers are alluvial rivers. So we have channels and we have floodplains that are features that are generally quite flat that border a channel that are periodically and very naturally um, inundated during higher flows. And what's important to note here is that it's not a flat surface or 
it shouldn't be a flat surface. Naturally, it's not flat, that there are lots of different shapes to that floodplain surface. If we look at a schematic of an idealized uh, river flowing through a valley, um, you will see that what tributaries come in, they can deposit water and sediment um, on the flat surface that they intersect with. This is often a floodplain. The floodplain, as I've mentioned, can have many morphologies. Some of them we learned in school, known as oxbow lakes. But the floodplain is a natural feature which has been built up over thousands of years by successive floods depositing sand and silt and clay. And sometimes during enormous floods, it can deposit boulders. But what's important are there, as well as the different topographies that we find in the floodplains, are also the natural occurrence of swampy or boggy areas. And it is the removal of these from the Irish landscape that has led to some of the water quality and water quantity issues that we now experience in Ireland. So here is an aerial shot of what a typical Irish river may have looked like before humans came in and intervened. And you can see here a naturally meandering stream. And these streams are dynamic. They are meant to move and they move across valley bottoms laterally. And when they do, they leave behind traces, just little fingerprints of where the channel was before. And these topographic lows are excellent opportunities for us to utilize to temporarily store water so that we can both filtrate some of the more harmful products out of the water, but also reduce the hazard of floods. Now we're going to focus on um, some of the issues that we have created. We're going to look at what the problem is. We are the problem. We are the problem in terms of what we have done to our landscapes, to our catchments, since we arrived as humans on the island of Ireland and how the development of agriculture in particular agricultural practices have led to some of the uh, more major issues that we experience uh, in Ireland. So if we look here on the top left, what we can see is an idealized system of early agriculture where we had the implementation of field boundaries and um, the um, um, increase in stocking density, um, but a fairly kind of um, balanced system with rivers. However, more recently with technological developments and the industrialization of agriculture, we have uh, taken over our rivers and attempted to make them work for us in terms of making the land drier or providing a source of water for our crops. We have employed several types of um, industrial machinery that changes the soil properties. So this has led to, and this is proven scientifically uh, through in various studies around our planet, it has lead, led to an increase in flooding, and this is without climate change. It has led to an increase in uh, pollution, i.e. a decrease in water quality. It has led to more incidence of drought. It has reduced our biodiversity and it has increased the carbon loss from our natural systems. So let me give you an example of what humans have done. So here we're looking at our drainage basin or our catchment. And this is a river system with what we would call a low drainage density. There's not a lot of surface uh, channels on this. And if we were to put in a discharge gauge and we look here, Q is discharge and T is time. With uh, events, we can see that we do have a raising of the level of water in a river, but it tends to be a low peak and a broad temporal framework. Now, when humans come in, they needed to adjust the landscape so that they could provide food for their families, etc., and communities. Uh, and society to grow. But with the more modern interventions, what we have under government legislation uh, and funding was the implementation of farm drains. Uh, poor land management has led to gullying development. 
uh, in urban areas, we've uh, tried to get rid of water by um, putting in from the Victorian era uh, storm sewer systems. And although this is idealised, what we're looking at is the types of changes that have happened to our catchment and to surface drainage. But this is the result. So again, you're looking at discharge, you're looking at time. And instead of a low peak and a broad uh, flow period, we're looking at a, what we would call a flash uh, hydrograph here, a flashy regime where we have a very quick rise to a peak flood, which is much, much higher than previously, and a slower uh, time of uh, the floodwaters uh, existing in that location. The second example, um, I've mentioned this before, is the uh, distribution of wetlands in our catchments, both in our uplands. So these wetlands would be the extensive blanket bogs, for example, that we have up in our mountains, and then some of these valley bottom wetlands. And again, we have a similar hydrograph to that that we showed previously. These have all been uh, drained through the installation of drainage, some of it through the arterial drainage network, and the resultant hydrograph is similar to uh, the one showed before. So the changes we have made on a catchment scale to our landscape has increased the flood hazard. And this is before we're looking at the impacts of climate change. If we want to look at how these changes in land use have affected the actual configuration of our channels and floodplains. Let's look at the case study of an idealized deforestation where we have uh, removed our forest because of a, a change uh, in land use from forestry to farming. So what you're basically having is pre-settlement. You had lots of riparian zone, alluvial forests growing adjacent to our rivers. This is the river channel here with river uh, with water in it and some channel sediment. Once we began to clear the land, we removed all of the ecosystem services that trees provide. And that includes intercepting water, but also keeping the soil on the land. And so it now was free to move when it rained and that sand was transported and silt and clay was transported to the lowest point in the uh, in the in the landscape, which is the bottom of river channels. And so what has happened is that the uh, river channels began to become more dynamic to try to adjust to all of this increase in sediment and their capacity uh, relative to the flows that were now coming in much faster were reduced. So we were no longer able to handle the amount of sediment and water that was coming into our rivers. And the response of the river was to aggrade or to uh, build up. And so because we have an increase in the runoff, so the rain running off our landscape, and we have a reduced channel capacity due to it filling up with sediment, what's happened is that peak flows have increased by 400%. And the suspended sediment, which affects our water quality and our aquatic habitats, have increased by 100%. If we look at our towns and villages and shopping centres and schoolyards, um, parking lots, let's call it urbanisation, what we've done is we've changed the shape of the surface from a naturally rough one with loads of topography, so with trees and bushes and everything growing on them, to a hydraulically smooth surface and combine that with the dense drain network that I've alluded to already. So here is, and look at the scale of it, some of the underground uh, human constructed uh, rivers, pipes that transport uh, water that we now have in our landscape. And this is what it has done. You're looking at the natural surface again at one of these hydrographs, discharge by time, low peak, broad kind of flow times, after the installation of these storm sewers, because the purpose of them is to get the water away from the urban areas as quickly as possible, but it's going into our rivers. And so after uh, the installation of storm sewers, you can see a huge increase in, in flood peaks, and then combined with that, the runoff just from the paved areas themselves, um, we have a very significant problem with both floods and the sediments and 
the um, sewage and uh, the um, all of the toxic chemicals that are um, basically washed off the streets, the oil, the petrol spills, all that kind of stuff straight into our rivers. One of the more significant ways in which we in Ireland have changed um, the way our natural channels are is through a process of channelisation, uh, mainly through the arterial drainage network scheme. Here is an idealised uh, cartoon of what our rivers may have looked like, uh, meandering channels with loads of riparian vegetation, which naturally reduced the force of floods coming down the valley because of the increased roughness. And um, the channels themselves would have had lots of um, what we call riffle and pool sequences. So this is just gravel kind of accumulations with deeper sections. You'll remember it from any time you swam in a river. Um, it's particularly around these uh, bends. And this is what uh, a typical idealised natural river looks like. This is what we have uh, done in Ireland to our rivers. We have taken an approach that we want to get the water away from the land as quickly as possible. So we have straightened our rivers. We have removed a lot of our riparian vegetation, our natural vegetation, because we want to put our floodplains that are alluvial soils that are drained very well and are nutrient rich. We want to transfer that into agricultural land. Now, for the aquatic kind of um, habitat, the lack of shaded trees will make the water relatively warmer and it's just not good for our salmonoids and our general aquatic habitats. In terms of the, um, the channel floor itself, you end up with an assortment of um, gravels, um, which are, 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 have lots of silt and finer sediment in it. And it's just not suitable for um, a lot of our aquatic species to thrive in. An additional effect of straightening our streams is the loss of these pools that are located uh, with these riffle systems. And you can see that um, these were refugia for um, fish during uh, natural droughts when the, the level in the river was, was much reduced. Now with the straightening of our channels, what we can see is that the uh, kind of reduction in roughness in the channel, we don't have bars in them, gravel bars and um, vegetation growing within the channel. Um, we have much higher velocities, like just hooning down these river systems, basically moving the problem downstream. So it's not reducing the floods, it's getting the water away from a specific area and moving it down to cause exacerbated problems further downstream. So if you're ever talking to the older and sometimes very wiser members of your family and they say, I don't remember floods like that and I don't remember this when I was a child. They're right. And it's not necessarily due to climate change. It's due to this history of what we have done and how we have physically modified our channels in recent history in the last 100 years in Ireland have led to a lot of the issues that we are uh, experiencing now. So I've described some of the basics of our rivers in Ireland so we can better understand how to manage them if we understand how they work naturally. I've also very briefly described how we've changed that relationship, the human relationship with our landscape and what impact that has had both on the landscape and on us. Now let's look to the future. Let's look to opportunities where we can kind of step back some of the more negative effects and enhance the positive ecosystem services that rivers can provide to us as a society where we can live more in equil equilibrium with our natural systems and benefit in, from the positive feedbacks uh, from those systems. There are a lot of uh, terms out there that are used when talking in general about uh, nature and how it can be utilised to help increase the ecosystem services that it provides to us. Um, you might have heard uh, natural water retention, nature-based solutions, natural flood management. So let's just forget all about the different terms and just talk about that, about how nature and using the natural landscape, natural vegetation, how that can um, be improved to help us mitigate against lots of the uh, very serious issues that are coming 
down the line in terms of climate change. I am not going to advocate that uh, nature-based solutions is the answer. It is part of the solution to a very big problem. So what we're trying to do is um, move Ireland from a very hard engineered approach to, uh, in their response to some of these issues to also utilizing uh, nature-based approaches. And I think, to be honest, we need both. We need both in order to mitigate some of these uh, significant hazards that we are facing. What the process aims to do is to move towards restoration. You can't restore what's gone. It's gone. It's altered by human intervention. But we can move toward restoring um, the catchment processes that we have uh, affected. And we can enhance their functionality um, in certain ways for example, by uh, planting native broadleaf species um, on hill slopes, uh, retaining um, water in peatland drains. Um, there are a number of measures that we can employ and deploy uh, with the aim to reduce the hazards of floods in our catchments. It's not just the story of water inundation but also the movement of sediment through our landscape now in our modern environment. You will all probably have seen at one time or another after a heavy rainfall just after fields are or shortly after fields are ploughed, the uh, running of these muddy flows, removing nutrient rich soil from the top uh, centimetre of fields in rills and gullies uh, down our roads and into our rivers, negatively impacting agricultural productivity and our river systems and water quality. And here is an idealized kind of sketch about, you know, the before picture, what um, these fields might look like. And these are the erosional rills. Now, one of the nature based approaches is to use natural soil and to build what's known as a bund, an earthen arcuate low wall that's about 50 to 100 centimetres tall that will sit in the topographic low of your field and trap that run of water and trap the sediment. And what that will do will be to prevent that water eventually reaching our rivers uh, uh, through our agriculture drains, through our road network. Um, and this has been shown, as in this case here, to be very, very effective. And when we think about installing uh, nature based solutions, we have to appreciate that these are dynamic uh, installations. These are not cement. And so they need to be maintained and they need to be uh, watched as to how they respond to the environment and to go in afterwards to adjust them, to make them taller or longer, as actually happened in this case. This flood happened the day after installation and the uh, people who installed it found that there was leakage of water um, uh, at the ends of, of this particular bond. And so they went back uh, when it dried out a wee bit and extended that. So it's that kind of simple, intuitive approach to managing our landscape, I think would work really well with the people who know our agricultural land, which is the farmers. They know the lay of the land, they know where the water goes. And if they were to receive payments for holding back this water and the sediment, I think we would be onto a winner for improving our flood hazard and improving our water quality issues. Another uh, unit which can be soft engineered, but using natural um, products, soil, um, can be placed within those um, abandoned channels and floodplains, those topogra natural topographic lows where water will naturally flow if reconnected, if the floodplain is reconnected to the channel. And these are known as offline flood storage ponds. And basically they will store the water allow the sediment and nutrients um, that are carried during these flows to settle out and to be trapped in this area before being allowed through an outlet structure to flow further downstream. And so this is a very simple solution, simply engineered, um, that will allow um, the improvement of water that is running off agricultural land. An example of a, an in-channel uh, natural structure are features that are known as leaky dams. So they're 
structures that are placed across relatively narrow channels. So this is suitable more for the upstream reaches where streams are small um, and they are dams. So they're in place to trap water behind them, but they're leaky dams. So they're highly porous. So water moves through them and you use the adjacent trees that either have already fallen down or you cut down some locally with permission and you build these um, either formally uh, using wire and nails or informally using the interlocking structure of the trees just toppled crisscross um, over each other um, across the river and they serve during higher flows to basically not stop the flow but slow it down and you might get 20 seconds of a delay behind these kind of structures and you have, if you have multiple structures separated maybe every 50 or 100 meters and you add up all of those 20 second delays plus these get filled in with leaves and twigs and they will trap sediment as well um, so you have a reduction in the sediment eroded product from the adjacent land reaching uh, downstream combined these have been demonstrated to be very effective in both reducing flood hazard and in improving water quality in the UK. And so finally, I want to talk uh, very briefly about some progress that is being made. So one of the barriers to implementing nature based solutions to our environmental issues has been um, governance structures. So the water framework uh, directive comes under the auspices of the Environment Protection Agency. The floods directive is dealt with by the OPW and up until quite recently they weren't really communicating with each other they had enough to deal with and there weren't, weren't any uh, formalized uh, communication structures between them but that has changed that there was a, a, a national level committee set up by the OPW to deal with natural water retention measures of which the EPA was a, a predominant member as well as all uh, very important local um, agencies were represented. And indeed, both the EPA and the OPW have put together a, an EPA fund that we um, are now using to undertake research in uh, natural water retention measures on agricultural land. So this is a project that I'm leading with colleagues in um, the UK and in University College Cork. It's called the Slow Waters Project. And the Slow Waters Project is basically intended to provide data on the efficacy of these measures, both for the attenuation of uh, or the improvement of um, water quality, so feeding into the Water Framework um, Directive and Water Quantity, the Floods Directive. And it's this approach of combining a, and opening up communication between the governance structures that really needs to be addressed for the future progression and deployment of funding mechanisms that will help us uh, implement these nature-based solutions within our catchments at a scale that is required for um, it to be successful. So this is something that I envisage happening over the next decade. And within this 10 year period, I predict that we will have a much better story to tell about the water status and the outcome of the implementation of European directives for both water quality and floods. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Mary. Um... That was wonderful and uh, wonderfully graphic in, uh, in in the ideas and the concepts. And so I hope uh, it has given you a good idea about what we're talking about when we talk about physical modifications and um, hydromorphology and so on. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker just to say uh, if you have questions, we're going to have some time for questions at the end of uh, Anthea's uh, presentation. So please put them into the Q&A uh, box so I can find them. And if, you, if there are questions for one or other of the speakers, please put their name beside it also. So Anthea is um, originally from Italy and she has a PhD in fossils, no less, extinct relatives of squid and cuttlefish, which I discovered this morning, what a fascinating thing to study. Um, and it works as a freelance science and nature writer and journalist. And um, Anthea comes to us today because uh, she recently wrote an investigative piece for Noteworthy. Noteworthy, uh, you may know, is the investigative arm of the journal.ie. And uh, it was called Breaking the Banks. And uh, Anthea's going to talk to us a little bit about her, her investigation and her findings. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, Anthea, and uh, over to you in your own time. 
Thank you very much, Borig. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, can you see that okay? We can, yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so um, delighted to, to talk to you today about this investigation, which, um, as you mentioned, is uh, published in Noteworthy, which is part of the journal.ie, and Noteworthy publishes investigative journalism. So these are stories that are funded by readers, so people who are interested in a given issue, and they, they fund this work. So it's issues that matter to, to people very much. Um, so just going to give you an overview of how we did the investigation, what we found very briefly. Um, it's quite a long article, so uh, I'll just touch on some of the main findings and I encourage you to, to have a read uh, of the whole thing. Uh, so the investigation was about Irish rivers and um, in particular we were interested in looking at the impacts of vegetation clearance on Irish rivers. So both uh, the vegetation that is inside the river channel and on the banks and along the banks. So in the lands close to the rivers, as you can see here, some lovely lush vegetation. So these are riparian habitats. And these are important habitats for many, many animals such as kingfishers, uh, but also things like otters, badgers, uh, other birds like dippers, gray wagtails, and then insects, dragonflies, damselflies, mayflies, um, and of course the vegetation itself is very important and leaf litter would fall into the, into the river. It would be important for the whole ecosystem. It would be food for fish, uh, trout, salmon, uh, lamprey. And of course, uh, the river itself in terms of the vegetation holding um, the bank in place, preventing erosion, preventing pollution as well. So these are very important habitats. And we wanted to understand a little bit more about the impacts of vegetation clearance, which is happening in many rivers in Ireland. So what we did was uh, we did interviews. So dozens of interviews with researchers, farmers, state agencies, environmental groups and campaigners. And we coupled this with, um, these are called access to information on the environment requests. So they're kind of like a freedom of information request, but it's more connected to the environment. Um, they're a very helpful way of finding out information that is not public available, publicly available. And um, actually anybody can do this. And the Noteworthy has a handy guide on how to, how to write and submit and access to information on the environment request. So uh, you can take a look at that. Um, so I'll just share briefly uh, some of the findings from, from the investigation. So um, as Mary mentioned already, um, I was just going to show you a, a graph um, and typically rivers naturally would have a number of features. So they would have these lovely meanders, bends in the river. Um, they would have uh, vegetation, uh, riparian vegetation. There would be swamps, wetlands, and the floodplain here is showing as well. So um, at times of flood, the river would break its banks and flood, and this would be a natural cycle. Um, however, in Ireland, what we found, and uh, this is perhaps the most stark of, of the things, and what surprised me most is that our rivers are so heavily modified and so heavily altered um, due to historical drainage acts. So these date back as far as the 1800s. Um, so what we've been doing to our rivers is really uh, turning them into unnatural um, bodies of water. And what we've been doing is really straightening them. And uh, we've removed the bends, we've deepened them, dredged them. And here you can see photographs uh, with spoil heaps on the sides of rivers. So this is material that would have been inside that has been moved and put on the, on the edge of the river. Um, so they're looking like many canals with um, big impacts on, uh, on the habitats. And these are photos as part of a master's project by Owen Concanon. And um, his research was on these impacts of arterial drainage works, um, particularly focusing on the Clare River catchment. And you can read a bit more about that um, in the article as well. Um, so arterial drainage work does continue today, uh, mandated by the Arterial Drainage Act. So we wanted to investigate this and what it meant in terms of vegetation removal. 
So what we found is that there's no single authority in Ireland responsible for clearing vegetation along rivers, um, but there are a number of uh, authorities and public bodies involved. So the OPW is one, um, but also local authorities in different counties. Waterways Ireland is another body responsible for some vegetation clearance. And then there are other uh, bodies such as uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, Inland Fisheries Ireland and the local authority water programme. And these have some level of planning and oversight on these activities as well and the EPA. Um, so um, under the Arterial Drainage Act 1945, so it dates back to 1945, was amended in 1955 and has had some amendments through the years. Um, the OPW is responsible for maintaining 11,500 kilometers of river channels in 33 river catchments. So um, you can see a list of these catchments on the OPW website with information. And each year, uh, about 2,100 kilometers roughly are maintained. So they follow a five-year cycle roughly. Now, 6,000 kilometers of these channels are close to or within a special area of conservation or a special protection area. So that means that uh, strict environmental regulations need to be followed in this case. And um, the OPW told us that 22,000 properties are actually located on the lands benefiting, so the lands adjacent to, to these river channels, um, so that they would be at risk of flooding if these works were not carried out. And uh, as well as this, 260,000 hectares of agricultural land is drained as part of this, um, these activities. And the Arterial Drainage Act historically was um, written and set up uh, to benefit agricultural land. So the reason for it was to drain the agricultural land to make it more productive by reducing flooding. Um, now it's just important to note that our investigation was not connected to flood relief schemes. So OPW has a number of flood relief schemes, um, vegetation clearance is involved in some of these, but we were focusing here on these 11,500 kilometers of, of channels um, as part of the um, Arterial Drainage Act vegetation clearance works. And then just to say that local authorities are responsible for about 4,500 to 5,000 kilometers of channels in terms of vegetation clearance and maintenance. So it's about maintaining these rivers um, in really what was an, an unnatural state um, in the first place. So OPW told us um, that there are two objectives to vegetation clearance. Um, one is maintaining the depth of the channel for drainage, and the other is maintaining the channel capacity. So to reduce flood risk to adjoining properties. And you've heard from Mary a little bit more about the flooding aspect um, and the risk. Um, and many, many, many experts we spoke to were concerned about the risk downstream of flooding from removing vegetation upstream. So it's a complex issue. Um, I'm going to run through a little bit more uh, of the findings. Oh, here we are. Um, so one example that came up in our investigation from access to information on the environment requests. Um, this is, these are pictures of a stretch of the river Brosna in County Westmead, and they're taken um, during an audit that was done uh, on OPW works in June 2021. So they show a lot of damage uh, to the vegetation. And um, the audit scored very poorly, scored bad, 15%. Um, so this is just one example. You can actually see a list of audits and you can click on PDFs in the article. Um, in this case, uh, the machine driver was retrained um, following this audit and uh, the next audit actually scored favorably and they recorded a great improvement um, four months later. Um, but yes, you can, you can see that, you know, there's great damage being done. <laughs> and, um, you know, the OPW is not the only body here involved. Um, Waterways Ireland, uh, one of the things that we found was um, a case in which environmental assessments had been done after the works taking place, and this, in this case Waterways Ireland works. Um, so this is a stretch of the Abbey River in County Limerick, and it's in the Lower River Shannon SAC. Um, so you can see the vegetation has been removed, but in this case there had been no environmental assessment. 
um, and a retrospective environmental assessment that was released to us during um, uh, from our access to information and the environment requests uh, revealed that there had been a, a loss of riparian woodland um, in, in this case. So we were focusing particularly on the environmental assessment process in the course of this investigation. Um, so really overall, I suppose most of the sources uh, that we spoke to express serious concerns about the riparian habitats in Ireland and the rivers themselves, so the shape of the rivers themselves. Um, so the, the pressures, this hydromorphological pressure that, uh, that Mary and Porig spoke about. Um, and it was very, very clear that the vast majority of sources believed that there needs to be a policy change. So um, the Arterial Drainage Act um, needs to be revised and updated. So um, the vast majority called for this change um, and for this law to be updated to take into account the latest science. So um, to take into account the climate and biodiversity emergencies that we're facing. Um, and of course, as part of the draft river basin management plans now, there are some indications that changes are coming and that it will be necessary to, it says it will be necessary to develop new legislation, including a bill and secondary legislation aimed at managing hydromorphological pressures. So um, hopefully change is, is coming in this respect. Um, and we also identified uh, positive aspects to what is happening to, to rivers in Ireland. So um, here on the left, you see an example of work done by Inland Fisheries Ireland, uh, working with OPW, and they are uh, putting back into the river structures that would have been removed as part of arterial drainage works. So um, these are gravel structures, paired deflectors, and they're helping to recreate, I suppose, the shape of a river, a uh, more natural shape with um, riffle pools, with a uh, change in water velocity. Uh, this is all very important for fish spawning. And um, then uh, here on the right, we see a before and after picture of work, um, nature-based solutions work um, done in uh, Donegal from um, the Inishowen River Trust. And here, um, uh, this is an example of a brash revetment. So it's a structure, um, a woody structure that's being placed into the river. So it's a mixture of spruce, um, of willow um, and spruce, and it helps to prevent erosion, alleviate flooding, and it also helps the river to stabilize. Uh, the bank over time then builds back, as you can see, and um, it's quite a dramatic change. And this has very many benefits, not just uh, for the river, for the habitats, but also uh, for the farmers and the land because their land builds back um, and um, increases actually over time. So that was a sort of a positive aspect uh, to, 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 to finish on, I suppose. Um, so, I encourage you to read the piece because it's very long and it has uh, many more um, many more points and more uh, <laughs> more examples as well. But um, I would like to thank uh, the the noteworthy team who helped and worked with me on this. So Maria Delaney, Niall Sargent, and also the editor Susan Daly. Um, and I wanted to end on um, some nice pictures of a river near me, the Vartry River um, in Wicklow, which seems like a, a nice example of what a river should look like before we, we, we came and damaged things. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that, Anthea. Um, uh, and I would echo what you've said, that you know, if you're interested in, in this kind of issue, uh, your article really is excellent and and uh, and please do go and, and check it out and read it um uh it's it's kind of important stuff and and noteworthy, noteworthy are really doing very important investigations around the climate and biodiversity emergency to me they're the the only uh, media outlet i see that are really digging deep into into some of the issues around biodiversity in particular and very very welcome um, Mary, I might ask you to turn on your screen there, please. We have about a, uh, maybe a 10. We might run over a little bit if there are more questions, but uh, we've got a few minutes for some questions. And um, Mary, I'll go to you first. I have a question, please, because um, we have uh, engaged with uh, the OPW in the past on this issue, and uh, particularly when it comes to, say, flood relief programs, and not the Arterial Drainage Act stuff necessarily, but say where they're trying to prevent flooding happening in a particular town. 
And it's all done on very, uh, you know, there's calculations and modeling done to, you know, calculate, you know, how much work needs to be done and how high the walls need to be and so on in order to keep the flooding out of businesses and homes, which is fine. But when we talk about, you know, uh, upstream forests and, you know, much more diffuse and, you know, permeable stuff, we're kind of told, well, you know, we don't have either we, A, we don't have the, the modeling to be able to calculate that, or um, it's just going to be so insignificant that it's not really going to make a difference. It's not going to make any impact on the, on the, the, the flooding in this particular town. I mean, do we have the science or the modeling or what is, is needed to get this into uh, the, the design of these schemes? Um, great question, because um, there's a couple of ways or a couple of items that we need to focus on here. First of all, the general um, narrative around nature-based solutions, particularly to flooding, is that it doesn't work for the big floods. The fact of the situation is we don't know whether it works or not for big floods and big catchments. That work is only beginning to emerge now from the UK and the UK government inv invested over 5 million uh, UK pounds to, uh, to, to support scientists to, to find out the answer to that. And it's encouraging. So we know that it works for small catchments, those sub catchments that I showed, one kilometer squared. And now the data, a recent paper showing that it works for 60 kilometer square catchments. Um, the OPW, the second point of information is, so that's an emerging field, sorry, the nature-based solutions is an emerging field and just watch the space and we'll find out how much it works and where it works and all of those things. So um, there are advocates that say, uplands is where we need to focus. And if at the very least, what it's going to do is help the, the more hard engineering structures down, downstream to cope with the big floods. The second important uh, issue is that under the floods directive, the OPW has uh, the legal requirement to prevent the larger scale floods, the one in 100 year floods, the one in 200 year floods. And at the moment, the technologies that are available suggest that the hard engineering way is the way to go. And there's enormous public pressure on them from the people who are living in the towns and villages that are experiencing all of the effects of all of this um, dredging of channels and straightening of channels and changing land use and soil porosity and everything. That's where it's being felt is in these villages. So it's about do we have the time to wait for the science to come out or do we just need to protect our people with these, you know, higher um, revetments, et cetera, in our towns and cities? It's, it's a battle zone at the moment in terms of um, people's approach to it, but we're, we're waiting. There's a lot of information that's been produced in Europe and the UK. We are 10 years behind. That's OK, because we can basically just adapt and adopt a lot of what they've learned from their mistakes and implement it in Ireland. Yeah, very much so. And, and the battleground is probably not only on, on science and research, it's also on explaining to people on the ground. I mean, I was looking at your leaky dams. Um, I mean, at the moment, if a tree falls in a river, it's seen as a flood threat. And, uh, you know, there's a race to get it out of the river as quickly as possible uh, because it might be a problem. So there is that kind of attitudinal um, issue, I think, that also needs to be uh, needs to be addressed. Anthony, you might tell us a little bit about some of the uh, the details on your on your investigation. Did, did you find you, you, were you looking at um, issues of legal compliance uh, with the with works that the OPW have been carrying out? Yeah, we were we were focusing on the environmental assessment process. I suppose the the first thing was just to clarify the process itself because a lot of people were unclear um, that we spoke to on actually how it works um, from the appropriate assessment and um, you know the natural impact statement all of those aspects and um, people had concerns about this transparency as well of these so um, one thing that we found was that there's been a change now to to Irish law um, that requires public consultation, it makes it really, really clear, a clear requirement for public consultation on these works. So that's a change that is now being been taken on board by OPW and they say that they will they will publish and they've started uh, to publish uh, uh, public consultation for these works. So we, we did we kind of dug into the detail of the, the environmental assessment process, I suppose. And uh, you you mentioned there that the OPW audits their own work sometimes, and sometimes they find that it's not up to their standard. But is there any um, independent auditing of these works, or or is there any anybody holding the OPW to account when when things go wrong? 
Yeah, this was a question that came up again and again, sort of, um, are the OPW their own competent authority is how it's often phrased. And uh, yes, in terms of the audits, uh, it's a mixture of internal and external audits. And OPW say they've increased the number of audits as well, um, about 70 to about 70 in 2020. Um, in terms of being their own competent authority, it, they would say that they, they are uh, the authority competent to make these decisions um, in terms of uh, the environmental assessment type of decision and that, you know, the, the next step would be judicial review. I, I think that's what we quote in the article. Um, so it's it's interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex issue and it's sort of an emotive issue I found for a lot of people, this, this whole area, um, you know, people get very upset uh, about these works. And um, yeah, uh, the whole policy change aspect, I suppose, is, is what emerged. Yeah, it's true. And, and it's also, um, it cuts into a number of areas, it cuts into agriculture and, uh, and other areas. And, um, and here's a question from uh, Una uh, in, in, in our audience, uh, Mary, uh, maybe it's, it's something you could answer. And it's, how do conifer plantations affect the flow of water over land? And, uh, and can the normal water cycle be restored effectively once conifers are felled? Mm, great question. Um, uh, so conifers as opposed to broadleaf species. So, so the, the general wisdom on this is that if you're going to a forest or anything, it's actually going to take quite a long time before you see the effects of that. So um, some people say up to 30 years. Second uh, data around it is that if you're going to plant anything, um, it's really the best effects are seen in the initial period of growth uh, when uh, the, the trees and roots are establishing themselves. Another uh, scientific fact is whether um, um, pines and spruce versus the more deciduous species, um, which is better and which is worse. And um, some people think that because uh, deciduous species lose their leaves during the winter, they're less effective because they can't, the leaf interception can't happen. But it's neither. It's neither the, the what, what is the enemy of the most effective uh, retention of water in the landscape is actually monospecies. If you have this, and this is the sicker spruce curse in Ireland is that it's one of species. So you need a mixture of both in, in our landscape. And there are different species that have different functions. So like intuitively, some of the roots go deeper, some of them spread wider. Um, and an additional issue for our planting of our landscape in Sika Spruce is we're doing it on peatlands. And that is a disaster and it's been shown to be a disaster, both in terms of our biodiversity, in terms of landslides, um, and in terms of the drains that are put in those bogs to allow those forests to grow. So it's a, it's a complex issue, but a simple answer is monospecies, whether they be broadleaf or uh, sick spruce, are not the best approach for uh, helping to alleviate floods. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's, it does it does point to uh, the complexity of these issues and ecosystem functioning are complex issues and our own economic demands and you know people on the ground trying to earn a living. Um, many of our environmental problems find themselves in this kind of nexus. Um, but I guess this is where we're going to have to go. We're going to have to kind of get into the, the, the weeds on that and, and, and uh, sort out the complexities and come up with solutions that, that work for economy and people and, and nature as well. Um, so look, two o'clock on the button, and uh, I think we will we will leave it there. Um, I'm very grateful to you both, Mary and Anthea, for coming along and, and sharing your work with us. Uh, it's fantastic to see the research that you're both doing. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, at home for taking the time out to, uh, to join us for this webinar. It has been recorded. Uh, we try and get it onto our, our website as soon as possible. Uh, where you'll see um, uh, lots of other webinars that we have done. We, have, we, we did one on nature-based solutions before, that's there as well. Um, so it's quite a nice resource, I think, the, the, uh, the webinars that we have done. And also, finally, before we go, um, next week, uh, will be the third in our webinar series on the Water Framework Directive, and we'll be looking at the various pressures uh, that our waters are under, uh, not including uh, physical modifications. And in particular, we're going to be looking at agriculture and wastewater treatment, uh, and we will also have a guest speaker from the Environmental Protection Agency to talk to you about that. So please do uh, tune in for that. And also don't forget that the public consultation on the Water Framework Directive is open until the end of this month. So please go to the SWAN website 
website um, and check out their resources on that issue and have your say. So thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.